I made the error of uh, uh, putting together a, ahead of time uh, a set of notes uh, so that I can't totally react uh, to Mike, and uh, I'll just give you my particular show, and then we'll get on uh, to the, uh, the, the counterpoint uh, kinds of things. So I'm reflecting a little bit on a personal journey, a personal journey that has taken me uh, uh, back to Washington uh, State from uh, the Antipodes, uh, from working in uh, decidedly professional education. Uh, RMIT is uh, original title was the Working Man's College. And uh, it makes Renton Pol uh, Polytechnic Institute, it looked like a high-minded institution. RMIT is a commercial operation to train first and foremost. And inside that, there's a little bubble of research that goes on and uh, is, is sort of tolerated. But the traditions of the university are like that. Uh, Université Laval, quite opposite, a very different kind of organization with a, a, a past uh, that vanishes into all kinds of funny stories about the, the, uh, the first uh, bishop of, uh, uh, of, of Canada. Uh, Laval himself. Uh, it's arguably of the same age as Harvard um, and has its own particular uh, um, interests. Both of these institutions primarily train surveyors. Uh, as you see, outside of the United States, it's quite possible to have a university that uh, trained surveyors. When I joined this institution, we had uh, a surveyor as a professor of civil engineering. We had a professor of photogrammetry and we had a professor of geodesy. We had a bunch of things that now you're not going to find uh, due to a whole bunch of, of disciplinary changes that have been going on during this period. So I have personal experience that takes has taken me to work, to practice, to uh, to a, a number of countries and a number of different models of what uh, education is like. And it, it's been a rich experience and it's something that I um, can report on to some extent. So I've always argued, as you may remember, uh, the diagram that comes out of uh, that moment that it makes your a professor's uh, guts just fall to the floor. It's in week five, and the well-meaning student asks you from the back of the class, what is this course about? <laughs> <laughs> it's a gut-wrenching moment, and it required me to think to the next session to come in and say, this course starts out as a very specific thing. It's about what can you take back from the landscape? What can you measure? And once you've done that, okay, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to stick it into some computer to be able to do something with it? And you will invariably find that the way you've done that is not going to solve the problem that you were there to solve in the first place, that you needed another measurement that you couldn't get. That's why we have a GIS. And it's because we're living inside of this outer set of framework of the questions that people ask us, the questions that come from this uh, outer set of uh, context or, or whatever you call it. So my experience is that this context, the outer boundary, and particularly also the institutional context, which is critically the interface between what you're doing and that society, whether you're working for uh, ACLU or you're working for the utilities 
uh, uh, Seattle City Light or you're working, the institutional context is going to come back to bite you very much. Disciplines are like uh, a bunch of crystals. If you hit them from a different angle, they break off in different places. And you get a different rock. You, you think you've got a different rock. It's actually from the same crystal. You're just seeing, you're just seeing it differently. Um, so I didn't, some damned reason, PowerPoint wouldn't allow me to expand that icon. <laughs> oh, I, you know, I, I think I put it in the wrong corner of the slide and, and then bang, I couldn't change it. But you've seen this body of knowledge piece. It's an, uh, art, uh, 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 an artifact of a very complicated process that is very much like uh, the Christmas tree phenomenon where there's never enough ornaments on a Christmas tree. You can always add something else. And there, there are bits in here. Every one of you needs to really understand deeply geodesy, surveying, photogrammetry, cognitive science, computer science, design, art, media studies, philosophy of science, sociology of knowledge. I don't care what the, no we could just keep on adding the list that you've got to, oh, you don't have enough training miles <laughs> in. <laughs> you know, the, f the physics behind LIDAR, the optics that goes on when you get refraction off of a fluid medium. Oh my God, you'd never had that. We could keep on adding all of the stuff you're going to do. The interesting thing, I think, from an educator's point of view here is this is a, the kind of thing that happens, a nervousness that happens in a group like the GI science field and just trying to say, oh, there's so much that we could put in here. Let's start, you know, <laughs> let's do it. Well, um, it was much easier when I started. <laughs> There, w there was only one cartography course to be had, and I took it, and it had Robinson's textbook, and hey, that was it. And, you know, uh, I drew all the maps by hand, and with my left hand, the ink all came off here, and it was a big <laughs> mess. Um, you know, I had fun with it, and I made a cartogram by hand, and uh, it was Uruguay. That's an easy case, by the way because Montevideo has 50% of the population, so you just make Montevideo big, <laughs> and you're done. Uh, there was only one co course in computer science offered to undergraduates. Okay. The, the University of Massachusetts at that point basically didn't have any way, you know, computers were not something that you taught. You did them. You got the Fortran manual, and you sat down, and you wrote a program, and what, you know, was there any theory involved? Hmm, not then. Uh, so I got my first job, not because of these, but because, hey, he's actually made a map with a computer. Whoa. I was, you know, pretty much of an instant expert at that point. Uh, it, it, I understand it's harder for you. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just, <laughs> I made it harder. Yes, indeed, I did. Um, so I'm seeing a, you know, a trend here where you know, Bothell is joining many institutions in, in putting in place uh, a uh, whatever it's called, uh, training, uh, a specialized master, one-year kind of course, two-year kind of course. There's, it's been going on for a long time. We're delaying the point that anybody gets into the workforce by adding more and more years of training for everybody. Um, that's a, a way that so society is reacting to the expansion of knowledge and uh, all the kinds of things that are required to understand all of these things. Where I taught uh, at Laval, I was in uh, a unit of 
with 15 faculty, all of them in the GI science field. Okay. And we had two degrees. One was for surveying, and one of them was called uh, Génie Géomatique. Uh, Geomatics is a, is a lame translation of Géomatique because it is the geo informatics. The informatique uh, means uh, computer science or informatics. And uh, so doing, putting the geo in there is a little play on words. Uh, and so it makes sense in French. It's miserable in, in English. Um, <laughs> Australia. Um, there's one unit that uses the geomatics term, and the rest of them use spatial in some way or another. Uh, RMIT had to distinguish itself from uh, Melbourne University, which is one kilometer away, uh, and so it uses the geospatial sciences to think. Both of these cases, a four-year degree essentially concentrating on just the GIS field. And here's just for an example of what you had to do to get the degree BH uh, 117. There are basically 32 courses you take over four years. You get three, count them, three electives. You're going to take basket weaving and uh, uh, Aramaic and uh, something else that you want to take. But then basically the rest of your life you know where you are. You're with the first years, the second years, the third years, and you're doing exactly what your cohort is doing. And so there's a bunch of math. There's a physics, surveying, cartography, GIS. What do you teach if you've got five GIS classes in a row that you know you've got the same customers and you're going to take them? You can't do that buffer exercise. Again, they already <laughs> did that two years ago. You got to give them something new. The last course is the institutional uh, professional practice course, the one where you can actually look at what is implementation like, how do you do implement, you know, that kind of thing. It's where I, I could have one lecture on that, okay? Uh, there's a whole course uh, in map projections. Okay? Yeah, I got to teach that, finally. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, the lecture notes from my predecessor were uh, 5,000 pages uh, of material. And I have to weed this down to something that your average undergraduate would actually engage with and actually do something interesting with it. But, you know, basically it's a mini geodesy course for people who aren't going to go do, in, go do, go do geodesy in detail. Um, but there are a few other things that you'll recognize. Final project, professional practice. Some of these things are where the real teaching happens. Despite all of your attempt to throw the whole kitchen sink in here, you can't get in everything. You really want a course in databases, but you, hey, you can't figure out where to stick it in here. You get bound by all of the constraints. And all of those kinds of things are dependent upon the particular mix of staff that you have. You know, the Tim and Nick show was basically limited by the fact that there are only two of us. And, you know, there's only so much we could get, you know, get done in a, on our two-year cycle. And Britta and uh, her, and uh, you've got a what can you do in one year with two people. Uh, it's tricky. And you've got to figure out what, you, what parts you're going to throw out of the bathtub. Um, so... Mike dealt with this, and he talked about the half-life without using the physics term, which is surprising for someone with a physics degree. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we're both in awe, perpetually, of course, of Walter Tobler and his vision of these kinds of things. Um, Waldo set out in 1976 that he wanted the half-life of his courses to be 20 years. 
I tested this uh, in uh, 1999 when I took over the 465 course, uh, which was the course where we had done originally the try to get them to draw <laughs> a polygon on the screen at the end of, this, of the quarter. Uh, you know, at that point in the 1980s, just getting a vector graphic up on the screen w took virtually 10 weeks to get, to get them ready to do that kind of thing. So I took over this course and tried to look at the topics that Tobler was covering back in 1976, and over 50% of what he was dealing was still relevant. I tried to structure this course specifically around a set of big questions that I thought were going to be persistent questions. And I have the 2001 uh, version of these through the uh, some kind of web channeling through the backups. That's the copy that I have. So the first question is, how much do you know about geodesy? Because you're going to need to know more than that to be able to understand what's going on when somebody says what a datum is. You've got to understand that to make your GIS work. What happened in El Salvador with that uh, problem with the, the, the streets of El Salvador was a datum problem, announced or unannounced. Sirgas, one of the versions, is off by uh, rather dis those who were he here this morning would have seen that. How does uh, GI uh, projection influence what you get? I'm still writing papers about that. Uh, how do you get a computation model for relationships? and uh, build topology, uh, represent data special relations, what's different about a database, uh, what is, at that point, it's object oriented. The buzzword now would be something else, but you still need to understand, okay, so it's objects. What does that give you? Yeah, objects aren't just data. Objects have method. And that's the part that rarely gets <coughs> through. We need to understand how we embed method into that model. Anyway, so those were the questions. That's how I structured 10 weeks. <sighs> so all you can get done, right? Um, so this GIS day should be an indicator of how the GIS education really works. We can throw out all of this, these long-term questions that you sh you're going to need to tick off to be able to make your project work. But also, you need to also get started. If the ACLU wants an answer in three days, don't start with geodesy. <laughs> uh, just pretend that Everett is flat. <laughs> you know, only got three days. <laughs> you know? So y you, need to, you need to push ahead a little bit. So th I think that in the model that we had of GIS education at uh, University of Washington, the internships, the, the community-based projects we had were the way to catalyze and say, oh, that's why I need to understand that, you know? It, it, brings it, it brings it forward so that you can understand what's going on. So uh, those of you who have come here today are engaging with the community. You're understanding that you have to work together. I think one of the mistakes of the body of knowledge is to think that every GIS professional will be a specialist in all of those. And the answer is your community that you work with, whether you go to this map, um, uh, map, time. map time, somebody at map time is going to know datums and is going to say to you, ah, that's, oh, oh, the harn means this and all of that kind of stuff. That's what you need to know about that. 
you need friends in this business. You need collaborations. And those collaborations are where that body of knowledge is a shareable and shared thing. And I think that there is a movement away from this single specialist who's got to know everything into a, a knowledge sharing community that open source and some of these things really reflect. So there we go. Um, a lot of the good ideas are going to come to you from problems that are posed uh, in, in these practice situations. So um, along with uh, other things, the Library of Congress is a resource for some of the best photography um, ever done, open source. Uh, download it a as you will. Dorothea Lang uh, had a better eye for um, the moment, the position here that we're all on a journey. And sometimes it might be faster to use some other medium. <laughs> but we've decided to address a really tricky problem, this set of spatial analysis questions. They're engaging. It's a great community to work with. We can go work in uh, Patagonia, or we can uh, go to Everett. Uh, your choice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, on the, I'm, I'm right in Patagonia with you, <laughs> no problem with that. Love the, love the photographs. Um, but uh, I hope that um, we can take this moment, this time, uh, to recognize how broad this community is, how many uh, different perspectives have to be all working to make this uh, uh, hang together and to, to, to get the results that we can uh, out, of, uh, out of spatial data.